of spending some time over the uh, New Year's holiday with Hayden and um, we were on a long ride towards to the beach and had the opportunity to have several conversations and we spoke a lot about development in the Caribbean we spoke about being positive we spoke about um, having an idea and following your dreams and I, I was I was intrigued I was intrigued I was enthralled and for the most part I was quiet listening because I always believe that when you're in the presence of greatness, one of the most important things to do is to be quiet and listen so that you might learn. And I thought it would, have been, it would be an important asset to our show and to our audience to invite Hidden Blades to have a conversation with us. I, I, I especially like the fact that we are going to be, we may discuss ideas, excuse me, the thing about ideas is that I believe that most transformations, most revolutions begin, began with an idea. The march in Washington, the civil rights movement, the end of apartheid, and many, many more revolutionary things or his, in, that, that, that um, in history, history, history uh, have begun with an idea. And I say this to you that when you have an idea, find the courage and the strength to develop it, to work on it. There are many who would say that they don't like to start small. Uh, their idea might not be big enough. But whenever I am, I am conflicted with these, these concepts, or I, I usually go to nature for my best lessons. And what I, what I come away with is that if a seed, if nature begins with a seed, if a tree, as big as a tree might be, or any plant begins with a seed, who am I not to, not to respect an idea, however small it may be? Dream big. Hold a second, I think that is our guest calling in. Yes, sir, good evening. All right, Selwyn. We are live, sir. All right, you can see me, hear me, everything? Well, I, I alone can see you. I, I want to go back and finish off my introduction and then take a break. All right, you can see me, hear me. I can see you. Yes, I'm sorry about that. That was um, our guest calling in um, from Trinidad. So I'll take a short break and... After the break, I'll introduce you to Hidden Blades. Aiden, I think while we're on the break, we should take a, a small um, sound check. Um, oh. Can you move a little bit to your left? To my left? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Um, you, you still need to go back some more to your left. More to the left? To your left, your left. Yeah. Okay, that's good. You're more centered <laughs> now. 
Okay. If, so when you come forward, okay, fine. All right. Selwyn Collins of CWS. Uh, tonight I have Mr. Hayden Blades. Hayden, how are you doing, my brother? I am well, sir. How are you? I am fine, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us on CWS. I really appreciate that. Uh, I know that your schedule was tight and you made every extra effort to be here on time. I, I really appreciate that. I, I Before you called in, I was telling the audience that um, I had I spent some time with you um, in Trinidad over the, the, the New Year's holiday. And we were on a long drive going to the beach. And we spoke a little bit on economics and development in the Caribbean and pursuing one's ideas. And what I mentioned to the audience is that just listening to you, I was enthralled. I was intrigued and enthralled. And I, I just became quiet because. I always thought that when you're in the presence of greatness or you're in the presence of, in, of wisdom, it pays to be quiet and listen because you, you know, you're never too old to learn, you're never too big to learn. Um, but most importantly, I, I, I told him I thought it was important to invite you to come on the show to share some of your knowledge and experience. So here you are tonight and once again, thank you. CWS welcomes you. And thank you, Selwyn. It, it's an honor to be with you and um, good evening to your viewers and listeners and um, let's see if we can make some sense of what's happening in the world around us yeah i love that i love that um, before we dive into into those um, wonderful ideas and concepts and so on i want to give the audience a, a sense of who hayden blades is could you just introduce yourself all right um, well, well, Selwyn, as, as you know, um, my profession is economist and I spend a lot of my time looking at the economic environment um, in Trinidad and Tobago as well as across the Caribbean. I also teach economics at the University of the West Indies on a part-time basis and I'm also uh, a teacher of uh, strategic planning for the Edinburgh Business School uh, of Harriet Watt University. And um, a lot of the work that I do is based on helping companies and individuals develop strategic plans uh, in this environment, develop business plans, uh, assist them with the process of determining the key features of their market, key features of their economic space and create appropriate strategies you know to build a competitive advantage and to maintain a competitive advantage in spite of all that's going on around us um, there are still opportunities that businesses and even state enterprises can pursue um, so effectively i spend most of my time either in the classroom or in the boardroom i see um where, where did this all start? I mean, what, what, what got you involved with economics? What, what inspired this trajectory? Well, I guess in, in many ways, I'm oriented towards public service. Uh, I, I grew up in a household of, of public servants. Um, my father is in, was in fact one of the directors at the CARICOM Secretariat and you know, he spent his career trying to build a regional agricultural sector and a regional trade framework. And um, it is in that context that I would have developed a, a, a keen view of what are some of the challenges faced by the region. And um, I guess the, 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 the whole idea of making life better for the people of the Caribbean via 
better economic policies, better trade policies, and so on. That that became uh, of keen interest to me. But you know, interestingly, um, when I did my A levels at Queens College in Guyana, um, I actually did all sciences. I did physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, and I was headed towards medicine. Would you believe? Wow. And um, I think it was during the first year. Of, of attempting to pursue um, medicine. I think I was spending a, a year in natural sciences, the Faculty of Natural Sciences, and we were required to um, do some uh, dissections of, 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 of uh, some amphibian, um, some reptiles. And, uh, you know, when you were doing the A-levels, most of the lab work was on dead animals. But at this stage, I was now working with live animals. And uh, I think at that point, I decided that um, economics would have been a better career pathway for me because the, the, the question of dealing with, with live animals and dissecting them and, and that kind of thing kind of changed my mind. And um, I, I went through a period of, 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 of real drama trying to figure out whether I should stick with medicine or, or, or change to something else. But the natural inclination was always to be involved in a career that genuinely helped people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so when you left, when you changed your career and um, ventured into, let's say, economics, were there, were there many challenges? Well, the switch wasn't that difficult for me because naturally um, economics is um, it's mathematically based in many respects, mm -hmm. but it also has very strong philosophical underpinnings. And coming out of that environment, um, it was easy for me to make the transition because having an appreciation of the environment of the Caribbean and the various political and, and sociological um, philosophies that informed our culture, it was easy for me to make that switch. I was living that every day in my household. In my household, um, you know, my father would entertain ministers of government, he would entertain heads of key state agencies and that kind of thing. So. I was always in that environment where we were discussing the way forward or discussing particular policies and events across this Caribbean. And it was a, so the transition was never difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, so the topic tonight, right? Your passion, your creativity, uh, monetizing your inner wealth. I want us to spend some time on that because a few people uh, contacted me and they were quite intrigued by that because one of the questions many people ask when they have an idea, you know, is where do I go from here? You know, and what do I do? And, and, you know, I have this wonderful idea or I've been working so hard on my business, on my concept, but I, I just can't seem to get, off, get out of this rut. Um, and I hope that tonight uh, part of that conversation will, will touch some of those things that we deal with, uh, but, yeah. but but be, before we, we get into there, you 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 grew up part you grew up part in Guyana, and then moved to Trinidad, right? Move back to Trinidad. Correct, correct. So you were actually. Uh, I I spent my formative years in Guyana. Um, I actually attended Saint Margaret's Primary School, mm. and from there I went on to Queens College. And I would have left Guyana in 1988 to go to the University of the West Indies um, in Barbados. And um, at that point, of course, the entire family by 1992, I think it was somewhere around there, the entire family returned to Trinidad and Tobago. And we basically have not left since. <laughs> So here you are, giving advice. I, you, you, uh, you, you are the president of, a, of, of, of a, 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 your own business or are you in part? Yeah, 
Um, I, I own a consulting firm called Business Insight Limited and what we do is basically help a lot of our clients uh, figure out the best way forward, develop their uh, strategic profiles, develop their strategic positionings within their industries. Um, we help them to, of course, ensure that the organization has a strong and uh, empowering vision and that their employees are on board with that vision. Um, those are some of the key things that we work on. And then there are the, the foundation type projects where we help clients figure out what's happening in the general economic environment and how they can build um, a, a strong competitive advantage in the context of what's happening in their economic environment. So that's the kind of work that um, we do at Business Insight Limited. And I've been doing that since 2008. Prior to that, I was actually the senior economist for RBC in the Caribbean here. Well, it was at the time RBTT Bank, mm -hmm. um, the Royal Bank of Canada in the Caribbean. And um, we developed um, in that regard strategic and important uh, profiles of what's happening in the various Caribbean territories in which the bank operated and so on. So it has been an, an, a natural outgrowth of that work that I have developed Business Insight to provide very similar services to companies around the region. Very exciting work. You know, you mentioned, you mentioned Vision Hayden and um... And and, 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 and and helping to to helping corporations to um, to pretty much develop develop their their um, their business and paying attention to having a strong vision and so on now how how, how important is a vision uh, let, let's talk a little bit about that how important is a is, is a good vision not just a corporation but let's say mm -hmm. the, the the young entrepreneur you know, yeah. or, or the one who, someone who is thinking about getting into business. How yeah. important is a vision? Let's, let's talk about that. Well, well, Samuel, let me tell you, everything, everything begins and ends with the vision. Mm -hmm. um, there is absolutely no way that you can create something that is sustainable from scratch, from zero, from base, from ground zero unless there is an enduring vision. In fact, I always tell students that if, in, if indeed they have an opportunity to assist a company in creating a vision, if a vision is properly created, the vision statement is expected to outlast the company itself. Because the vision statement speaks to the fundamental purpose of the company. It's, it's reason for existing, it's, it's raison d'etre, um, if you like. The vision really identifies the, the underlying philosophy of what the company is about, what the individual is attempting to achieve. Mm -hmm. And any entrepreneur um, ought to have an enduring vision. And most times they do. Of course, it may not always be formalized and, and codified, in a particular way. But if you ask the, 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 the typical successful entrepreneur, there was always some key milestone, some key objective that they were insisting on achieving no matter what. And that is what would have kept them, you know, that would have sustained them through the tough times, through the uncertain times, you know, um, that is essentially your motivator, your driver. That is what you dream about when you get out of bed every morning. That is what you are working towards, that vision, that, that point where you can see a, this is exact. So P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, as, as he was formerly known, has a vision. Um, Steve Jobs, when he was alive, would have had a very strong vision for Apple. Um, Larry Page has a very strong vision for, for Google and so on. 
Um, you see Michael Dell would have repurchased or is in the process of, of taking Dell private again. So he has a vision. What is critical? Oprah Winfrey started off with a very, very strong vision. And, and they would have started um, identifying exactly what they wanted to achieve at the end of the day. So they began their journey with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, um, that, that is so very uh, informative, um, the, the importance of a vision. I, I, I can't stress enough how um, critical it is to have a vision whenever you're venturing into something. Um, I, for instance, starting CWS, I, I had to have a vision because one of the things I, I discovered um, with having an idea and putting it into effect is that you have many advisors, um, both solicited and unsolicited advisors. And if you don't have a vision, you don't know where you're going or why you're doing what you're doing, then you're easily distracted. So I, I underscored that point, that a vision is, is very, very important. You mentioned strategic development. Um, I know our audience is very diverse, but one, of the, one group that I speak to especially are the youths. Because one of the things I hope out of these conversations is that um, young people will see um, adults uh, who are successful on their way to success and not only that, we'll, um, by hearing about these, um, the, the, this, the challenges that some of these guests might have gone through, may have recognized similar challenges and be inspired to overcome or step beyond their limitations. And so because I have that demographic as well, I sometimes try to ask my audience, to, my guests, to uh, sort of break down some of the concepts so that um, not that I'm insulting or I'm underestimating my, my young listeners, but sometimes it, it helps for them to um, follow along in the conversation. So you, you talk about strategic planning and strategic development and so on. Um, give us an example of a company, or not an actual company, but an example of a strategic um, development. Yeah. It, it, it's quite simple. Um, Selwyn, whenever we are trying to achieve anything, um, it's important for us to appreciate that we, we have to begin with an idea of where we want to end up. So effectively, a strategic plan identifies very clearly how we move from where we are now to where we want to be. And essentially, with the concept of a strategic plan, you are attempting to chart the way forward by clearly identifying not only your key objectives, but also clearly identifying what you're going to do to achieve those objectives. So you need to have a set of strategies that delineate how we move from where we are today to where we want to be tomorrow. And then also, in conjunction with that, we also need to identify, well, how do we know that we are there? What are some of the key things that we need to measure to determine whether or not we are in fact accomplishing this vision or we are in fact accomplishing these objectives? So there are three critical elements to your strategic plan. Firstly, the identification of where you are now, which is what we refer to as the current state assessment the identification of where you want to be, your future state assessment, and that includes your visioning and your objectives and so on. And thirdly, the strategies, the things that you're going to do in order to bridge the gap. But also, very important, um, the question of how do we know when we are where we want to be has to be answered on a regular basis and we do that by having the right performance measurement in place to determine whether or not the strategies that we have identified are actually helping us to achieve our objectives. So strategic planning in, in, a, in a broad sense is about bridging the gap between where you are now to where you want to be. 
Now, the interesting thing about it is that in order to understand where you are now, you have to understand what's happening in your broad environment. Mm -hmm. So your economic environment is important for you to understand what's going on around you from an economic point of view. It's important for you to understand what's happening around you in terms of the underlying social trends as well. You need to have an appreciation of your technological trends and, and the implications of all of the above will be an important component of appreciating your current state. And then, as I mentioned, in terms of divisioning, the question is, well, what exactly do you... I think... It is more than just an idea. Uh, Hayden, Hayden, just, just it, a moment. Um, I don't know if you can repeat the last two or three sentences. We had a little problem and, and Skype stopped, so we may have to forward our listeners okay. on board. Okay, yeah. Um, just let me repeat what I was saying there. It, it, is, it, is, it is important for us to ensure that the strategic plan in, in the broader sense mm -hmm. helps us to bridge the gap between where we are now to where we want to be. And in that regard, we need to have very clear strategies. But the final and most critical element of the strategic plan is really to identify how do you measure the progress between where you are now and where you want to be. So you've got to be able to measure very clearly, very objectively, exactly how you are, in fact, achieving the success that you expect. Uh, many times, companies and individuals are very clear as to what they want to do, but there is no specific timeline to it. There are no specific measures to determine whether or not you are actually accomplishing what you have set out to accomplish. So measurement of your progress is also critical. The other thing in that regard is that at the end of it all, you need to have a broad philosophical view of what this company is all about. Mm -hmm. Now, it is one thing to have an idea, but what are you attempting to achieve in the broader sense? I mean, I might have an idea for a better mousetrap, but am I trying to create a better world? If you look at these successful companies, if you understand the philosophy upon which those companies were built, you would appreciate that in many instances, it was more than just an idea. There was a, a philosophy behind the company. So I have a good friend of mine who, um, in Trinidad and Tobago, has developed a very successful beverage company. And what he does, he does fruit juices. And in many ways, his company is more than just about bottling a good fruit juice. The company is about providing people with very healthy alternatives in terms of non-alcoholic beverages and so on. So it's really about encouraging a healthy lifestyle. So he has a broader view of what he's doing. And because he has a broader view of what he's doing, he never diminishes what he does just to the simplest task of creating a bottle of juice. That's not what he's doing effectively. What he's doing effectively is providing people with the opportunity to live healthier lifestyles. Now, you see, when we hold on to the broader philosophical view of what the company is about, what the individual is about, then everything that we do has significance, has relevance, and it cannot be diminished to its simplest task and therefore lose sight of why we do what we do. Why do we get out of bed every day? What exactly is our passion with respect to this particular issue? You know, <clears throat> so young people need to appreciate that it is vitally important to be passionate about what they're doing, mm -hmm. and they need to appreciate that they need to have a long-term view of what they're attempting to achieve. Uh, that's 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 very very interesting, um, especially the, the the concept of having a philosophical philosophical view, and. You know, sticking with that because I can I can see that as 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 the the um, the guiding principle behind what you're doing and, <coughs> and how yes. how much it can keep you on on track when you're being distracted or keep you focused. Um, 
there, to, the, I, I mentioned to you that this is a three-dimensional process, and every now and then people come into the chat room and ask questions or make comments. So Beverly Drake said, did the economic asked, did the economic crisis in the United States affect businesses in the Caribbean? Say that, say that, repeat that for me, Sullivan. Did, did the economic crisis in the United States affect uh -huh. businesses in the Caribbean? Affect businesses in the Caribbean? Most definitely. Uh, let me tell you how it works. Um, in the Caribbean, we are in fact heavily dependent on a trading relationship with the United States. So for many countries in the Caribbean, um, the tourism sector is critical to the survival of those economies. And so the crisis in the United States would have significantly limited or diminished the number of tourists coming to the Caribbean in that, in the, that, that period of time, 2008, 2009, and so on. Now, since then, um, the tourist arrivals have, in fact, improved um, substantially. However, the critical issue has been, even though we might have been able to recover in terms of getting the typical number of tourists to visit our shores and so on, the challenge now is getting them to, to spend when they do come to these shores. Um, a lot of our Caribbean neighbors, Caribbean brothers and sisters, um, St. Lucia, uh, Grenada, Antigua, Jamaica, and so on, they are in fact still recovering from what happened in the Great Recession that started um, in the United States. So it, 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 whatever would have happened in the United States certainly would have affected um, us here in the Caribbean. And of course, you know, there's a typical saying that when the United States sneezes, the rest of the world catches the cold. Well, we in the Caribbean, we, we get the cold first before everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Um, the Caribbean has about what? About four to four to one million people. Yeah, I guess if you, if you include the non-speaking, the non-English speaking territories, oh. um, yeah, you, you're talking probably close to close to 15 million people. That's that's more like it. Wow, you know when I, when I when I um, when I think of developing nations or or on the on developed nations, and I think of Africa and what's happening in Africa, and I, I am present to the emerging markets that that is, are taking place in Africa. I often want. I'm not an economist, so I, you know, I, I, I depend on people like you to inform me on in these things. Um, I think of the Caribbean, and I think, wow, with so many millions of people, such a large population, um, but with diverse uh, culture, uh, social, social, economic uh, backgrounds, and culture, and natural and human resources. Um, first of all, the question I would ask: Are there emerging markets in the? And how can the Caribbean um, capitalize on that, that population um, to be a, a viable economic uh, for something like the European um, community? Well, the Caribbean itself, um, in, in many ways, you know, our financial markets are less developed than the typical emerging market type country. So like in the Caribbean, one would consider us to be um, the, the newly emerging, if you will, Trinidad and Tobago might be in that category. We are generally considered to be middle income countries um, as defined by the multilateral lending agencies. Um, but generally speaking, our, our small size um, may preclude us from falling into that, the typical emerging market country. Uh, the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and so on, um, they are the, the, the new guns, the new engines of e global economic growth. And of course, if you would have observed over the past few months, the slowdown in China has created a ripple effect across the world. But ultimately, 
the Caribbean has been able to survive in many instances based on a sort of monocultural type economic structure. So for instance, you would find that in the smaller territories, um, such as uh, St. Lucia and Grenada, St. Vincent and so on, the agricultural sector has been important to them. Agricultural exports has been an important source of revenue, foreign exchange for them. And they have augmented that with services such as tourism and financial services and so on. The territories in the in the English-speaking Caribbean that tend to have a slightly different um, orientation when it comes to the commodity that they typically will export would be territories like Trinidad and Tobago, like Guyana, like Belize. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago is able to export crude oil and natural gas, as well as petrochemicals that are processed from those key inputs. Um, and so Trinidad and Tobago has benefited over the years from elevated crude oil prices and of course, in recent times, has benefited from the export of liquefied natural gas, as well as methanol, ammonia, urea, and so on. That's the mainstay of, of this economy. Guyana would have been an important exporter, not only of uh, sugar and rice and other agricultural commodities, but also an important exporter of gold and uh, over the recent years, um, there has been heightened interest in Guyana's potential to actually produce crude oil um, off its coast. So a lot of the, the larger territories um, have been able to work harder at developing their natural resource base whereas the smaller territories have been able to focus more on the development of a tourism base, a service base. And it, that's in a nutshell precisely how the various countries of the English-speaking uh, Caribbean function. So, someone had asked me today to, to ask a question, if they don't uh, tune in, about investments in the Caribbean. Mentioned oil and natural gas, and um, some of the things are like renewable energy and telecommunications and banking and so on, um, tourism, logging, mining. But let's take a break. When I, when I come, when I, we get back, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of these um, major sectors of investment, and then we could move on, move into um, the topic of the of the evening um, about discovering, uh, monetizing your inner wealth and so on.
Marcus and Selvan Collins with Hayden Blades. Hayden, how are you doing, my brother? I'm good, man. This is wonderful. <laughs> um, before the break, we um, we talked about um, the major investments, major sectors of investments in the Caribbean. Um, could you could you could you expand a little bit or tell us a little bit about um, some of these investments, these sectors of investments? How are they doing today? Is is it still with, with the uh, U.S. economy as it is, or the global economy as it is, are these still attractive sectors of investment in the Caribbean? Um, the Caribbean will always um, have uh, fairly attractive investments, depending on, on the, 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 the sector in which you're interested. I'll, I'll give you an example. If you're able to invest in a hotel, let's say in Jamaica, and that hotel, via its linkages with an airline, can encourage uh, visitors to the hotel. Um, chances are, within 10 years, you can recover the initial investment in a hotel of that nature. Um, the, 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 typical, the typical investment in tourism will be along the lines of you know, expanding the hotel stock along the lines of providing some kind of support service to the hotel sector and so on. Um, but in countries like Trinidad and Tobago, where there is a well-developed energy sector, um, the investments tend to be more along the lines of exploration and production activity for crude oil and gas. So we're talking about billion dollar US investments. The investments also tend to be along the lines of downstream activity in the energy sector, which includes um, you know, the production of ammonia and urea, methanol, and so on. Again, those are billion dollar type investments. And then in support of the actual direct production of those commodities, there is an entire supporting industry that supports all of that, you know. So the investments too can be along the lines of investing in the support services, much like investments in the hotel sector can also uh, lead towards the support services as well. So effectively though, um, what you will find in the Caribbean is that in countries like Guyana, where the price of gold has been fairly elevated over the past few years, so gold is probably somewhere in that 1500 US to 1600 US dollar per ounce uh, range, you'll find that um, there's a lot of interest in the expansion and investing in the gold mining activity in Guyana. Um, Guyana also has a fairly vibrant bauxite sector. And in that regard, you know, um, all of those commodities, aluminium, which is uh, produced from bauxite, uh, is still and will still be in fairly high demand across the world. And so the demand for bauxite will follow the demand for aluminium. And therefore, that too. Uh, represents another critical um, investment opportunity that the Guyana government and supporting agencies will promote. But a lot of the underinvested areas in the Caribbean would actually be in areas like agriculture and agricultural processing, the processing of food, uh, the, the creation of higher value added food products. So while we may export rice and sugar and uh, uh, the pulp of fruit and so on to a number of dis different destinations, I think there is a lot of scope for investment in higher value added processing of food for the creation of other things like uh, chocolates and so on. Trinidad Tobago has an excellent variety of cocoa bean, 
and it is world renowned it is well known it is used by the biggest chocolate companies chocolate connoisseurs always speak highly of the who varieties and so on Trinidad Tobago also has some of the best peppers um, and in fact they export the genetic material of the pepper um, to the United States and Europe uh, for use in the production of other higher value added type pepper sauces and that kind of thing so there are opportunities um, across the tourism sector across the energy sector and even in the agricultural sector for investment and when in fact, just before the Great Recession um, took hold of the world environment, there were significantly high levels of investment in gold mining in Guyana, in energy in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I think Suriname would have attracted some investment in agriculture as well, because they have large unused tracts of land in Suriname. Um, so those are the key sectors that you would typically find high levels of investment. Trinidad Tobago has also been able to attract a high level of investment in the financial services sector because in 2008, Royal Bank of Canada bought the RBTT Banking Group. Um, I, I don't know if you know the history, the RBTT Banking Group would have originally been um, the Royal Bank of Canada that was in the 70s. Right. But the then government would have nationalized, localized, as they prefer to say, um, a lot of the um, foreign-owned banks in the 1970s. And it was only in 2008 that Royal Bank of Canada actually returned to Trinidad and Tobago and purchased uh, the Royal Bank, the RBTT banking group, for about two billion U.S. dollars. Um, so that kind of investment is also being made in the financial services sector and there are other um, opportunities for foreign direct investment in other smaller sectors of the economies. But I guess in that respect it would be more company specific in that regard. Um, but recall Selwyn that all of these countries spend significant sums of money to attract investors to their respective shores. So all across the Caribbean, governments have set aside funds, they have set up agencies to attract foreign direct investment outside of the tourism sector and so on. So this is a critical area for the, the, the future of the, of the Caribbean. So if, if someone, someone was listening saying uh, and thinking, wow, well, I have some money or I have, I'm part of an investment group, we have some money. And I would like to, we'd like to invest in the Caribbean. Who do they contact? Where, where do they start? Well, it's easy. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a company that was recently formed called Invest TT. Invest TT. And if you Google Invest TT, you should find um, the website. There is also the tourism development company. They too are important facilitators of investment. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago. But as I said, the better approach for anybody wishing to invest um, in territories across the Caribbean, the better approach is always to look for the state agency that deals specifically with foreign investors mm -hmm. and work with them um, to identify the best possible investments available to you and also to help you cut through some of the the typical bureaucratic um, barriers that may discourage the, the average investor. Yeah, you know, I, I'm listening to this conversation. I'm listening to you speak, um, Hayden. And once again, I, I am enthralled. I'm, 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 I'm learning so much. Uh, but one question comes to mind that is, is um, prevalent in many, many social circles, uh, especially when we go hanging out and so on. Um, among the, the alumni, so the, the, the alumni from Queens College and these top schools in Guyana, and some people are disillusioned with the Caribbean, or especially Guyana. Um, some would like to go back or like to, to invest or, or start businesses, but more often than usual, you hear, man, you know, disillusionment. If you 
I know you believe in the Caribbean, or I suspect so. Um, with, with your exposure, your experience and knowledge, uh, what would you say to a group of guys that born in Guyana, grew up in Guyana, educated, came abroad, afforded their education, have some money, but are a little bit disillusioned? How would you encourage them to consider investing in the Caribbean? All right. I, I have grappled with that issue for years. Um, and it's a, it's a very pertinent question. Now, let me say it this way. Let me put it to you this way. The people who live in America, they love America. They build America for their children, their grandchildren, and their children. If we want to have a legacy, if we want to preserve our heritage, if we really want to have something that we can tangibly identify as being the product of our collective efforts as a people, then we have to commit. I mean, I understand that people will say, well, life is too hard. In some instances, the inconveniences that we must endure, we don't have to endure when we are living in the more developed countries and so on. But my point to folks like that is simple. Well, if you don't develop your country, then who is going to develop your country for you? Is it that you, you will be a lot more encouraged to live in your own country once it is developed. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that Americans developed America. Americans didn't migrate from America to go live somewhere else and hope that America was developed by somebody else. So the, the issue, once you, once you craft the argument in those terms, the issue is simple. If you want a developed country in which to live, and you want your home to be a developed country, then you must develop it. You must contribute to the development of your country. You cannot expect that in some magical way, some politician will wave a magic wand, or some multilateral lending agency or some non-governmental organization will find the grand solution to the underdeveloped status of your country. You have to work, you have to put your shoulders to the wheel, you have to put your hands on deck and help fix what needs to be fixed, help attract the investment necessary to build out the supporting infrastructure promote your country in a positive manner to the rest of the world and create, using all that you know about yourself and about your culture, create an environment that the world can come and experience life as you know it in your country. And they will pay handsomely for that experience. Nobody else can help your country develop. You've got to develop it yourself. And it's as simple as that. If you're not willing to do that, then you don't have the moral authority to ask the question, when will it be possible for me to return home? Or how will it be possible for me to live there if I do return home? You understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. I love that. Um, and and the, 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 the point of commitment and sacrifice comes to mind. Um, I, I, let me just go to the chat room for a second. Carl, Carl said, or asked, what, what has been the key impediments to establishing value-added industries? Oh, good question. Um, I, I think, I think um, Selwyn, with respect to the establishment of value-added industries, um, what has plagued the Caribbean, the Achilles heel in the establishment of value-added industries is that historically 
these economies developed on the basis of exporting primary commodities, unprocessed commodities. So if we discover oil, we export crude oil. We don't export um, jet fuel. If we have land and we, and we plant sugar cane, we, we don't export uh, sugar cubes or packets of sugar. What we export is bulk sugar. And traditionally, historically, that has been our economic structure. So we export the low value added, low priced commodity in high volume. And then we turn around and import in sometimes equally high volumes, the higher value added items. So we will send our pineapples to the UK and then we will turn around and buy pineapple jam from the UK. You understand? Yes, yes. So having lived that experience where we are accustomed to importing the things that we need, living in that experience, we have grown accustomed to recognizing that whatever is imported, whatever is foreign, is better than whatever we can produce at home. It is what one of, the, one of our celebrated local economists referred to as the Muscovado bias. Lloyd Best, I think, coined the term Muscovado bias. We have a bias, and that bias is an import bias. So we will import the foods that we want to eat, but we will export the basic commodities to make those foods. You see, because we don't believe in producing for ourselves, and by extension, producing for the rest of the world in that respect. We would rather just export to them basic commodity and then import from them the higher value added item. So, so historically, so we, we've had that experience historically, that, 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 that imbalance between what we produce, what we export, and what we import. That's the imbalance. So, so we have grown up in that system. And so the, our culture has, 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 has been built up around that bias. So that's one impediment. So that's a cultural issue, a social issue, more than an economic issue. The economic issue, though, may very well have to lean on some of the impediments to creating the enabling environment for businesses to thrive. Um, in many instances, because of our small size, we do not have well-developed markets, well-regulated markets. Um, we do not have what one would consider to be um, very enabling business environments, even though we have been spending significant sums of money in trying to fix all of that. Now, because of the weak enabling environment for businesses and for the evolution of industry, um, that may also be an important impediment to the creation of higher value-added investments. In fact, um, what you will find, and this is the irony of it, in our banking systems, you will find that we have excess liquidity. And typically, that might indicate a lack of opportunities for investors to invest. But the, the, the thing is that it is not for a lack of opportunity. It is that there is a lack of investor confidence to invest. Mm -hmm. And an important part of that is because investors may find it difficult to quickly turn around their investment in the non-energy sector in particular because of some of the basic impediments to the establishment of business and so on. So these are some of the deficiencies in the general business environment that governments work very hard at correcting, uh, breaking down the barriers to 
local and foreign investment, especially in the non-energy sector. So it, it, essentially you have both a social and cultural issue that may impair our willingness to export value-added products. And secondly, the business environment may not always be as supportive as it ought to be, especially to local and foreign investors. Hmm. Um, so Car Carl asked, uh, made a statement, what has been some of the key impediments to creating the value? Uh, well, I guess you just answered that, uh, yeah. to creating True. the value added food products in the Caribbean. And Natasha said that promoting and supporting will only happen if we have a sense of ownership, which at this point in most islands, we don't. Um, I don't know if the issue can be narrowed down to this whole question of sense of ownership. I, I think if you, if you talk to the average citizen mm -hmm. of the Caribbean, one may get the impression that they do have a strong sense of ownership of their land, of their culture, of their heritage. I think the Achilles heel, the real barrier to translating that sense of ownership into proactive or progressive action by the citizens is that there may be an over-reliance on a very slow-moving um, political culture. I think in many respects, our political culture is not as facilitating as it ought to be. And in many ways, our political culture sometimes can actually retard our growth. And I suspect, I suspect, um, one can of course always point to certain empirical um, evidence and so on, or identify key turning points in the history of our Caribbean as far as the politics and the economics are concerned. But I suspect, Selwyn, that in many ways our um, antagonistic political culture um, limits our ability to make the best use of our human resource potential and talent and so on. I'll give you an example. It is felt by many commentators, analysts and so on, that because of the, the typical two-party system in these small islands and this winner-take-all philosophy of the first-past-the-post type political system, that in many respects, at any given point in time, only half of the population is ever being utilized to the advantage of the whole country. Why? Because if you don't support a particular political party or if it if it is suspected that you are not a supporter of that particular political party, then there's a great likelihood that you may not find opportunities for professional expression. In other words, you ain't gonna get no big work no way. You're not gonna get no contract to do anything. And effectively, you're, you're going to be you know, on the fringes of what's happening in the broad economy. There is, a, there is a political dimension to that. And in many ways, it has limited our ability to maximize our, our human resource capabilities and potential. And because of that, we find it difficult to sometimes achieve that critical mass of economic activity that will provide us with a stronger platform to enter the global marketplace and be stronger competitors. You know, uh, that brings to mind a, a question I often ask. Um, with, with the advent of cyberspace and the, the, the shifting and changing of uh, the transformation of paradigms that it has evoked, um, from Asia throughout the Caribbean and so on, and, and we have we have seen uh, many political uh, transformations or, uh, took place because because of cyberspace, like in the Middle East and so on. Um, so the youth seem to be um, 
taking uh, or, or sort of influencing um, politics to some degree. At least that's my that's my idea um, or my, my my perspective on things. Do you see a do you see a um, a, a sort of conflict with the established or the traditional political system as it is and the the current youth and their passion for explore for exploring and, and their access to to cyberspace and what's happening in the larger glo global or more developed nation do you do you see a, a, a conflict or a, a clash of um, that's going to take place um, among the ideologies of these governments and what the youths believe that are, uh, how uh, what the youths believe that they need to um, make a difference in, in their in their future. Well, so when to be honest, huh, I I really don't see our youth in the Caribbean adopting um, that kind of Arab Spring sort of stance. Why? Because I think our youth have basically decided to ignore the politicians and try to find the best way around, um, you know, the, the, the dysfunctional political culture. Mm -hmm. I think for the most part, the progressive thinking youth has basically decided that the best way forward is just to forget the ignore the the political the dysfunctional aspects of the political culture and try to do their best um otherwise now whether or not um that approach is the best one i really can't say because only time will tell um but i can say though that the electorate the voting public they have become more sensitized to the importance of good governance and uh, properly functioning government. As a result, they are willing to be a lot more discerning in terms of how they cast their vote. And I think people recognize the futility of political persecution as a result, they're not willing to tolerate that kind of political dynamic any longer. I think the question of racial politics has been with us since independence. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago gained independence in uh, 1962. Guyana gained independence in 1966. And uh, since prior to the independence movement, the issue of racial politics has always been a debilitating issue. But I think our young people, the progressive thinking young people, have also recognized the futility of that kind of political phil philosophy and they have determined that the best way forward is to have a collective, collaborative approach. So regardless of class, regardless of religion, regardless of texture of hair or skin tone, I think our young people have recognized that we're all just human beings. And we all have our different talents. Because, I mean, so when, they, when they look at all the various artists, mm -hmm. you know, I was asking my young, my, my nine-year-old son, well, um, this fellow Bruno Mars. I mean, I can, I can scarcely determine whether Bruno Mars is a, is a Native American, whether he's Italian, whether, whether he's from Hawaii. I have no idea. You know, right. and, and that's how they're seeing their world. They really don't care. True. You know, in the past, Bruno Mars management team might have advised him to look a certain way so that he appeals to a certain segment of the population. Not true? Yes, very true. But not anymore. Be who you are. Enjoy your life. Enjoy the talent that you have. 
and make the world a better place. End of story. And I think that's exactly what the young people want. But I don't think at this time in the Caribbean, the young people are, are, are in, a, in, a, in a state where they want to take on, head on, you know, the political culture. I think they're, they're, they're prepared to ignore it for the most part. But and, and talking about end of story, this brings me to the beginning of, of um, the, 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 the point of our discussion. And uh, one of the taglines is um, monetizing your inner wealth. Um, how, what does that, what does that mean? To those who are, you know, seen it and, and and they're attracted to it, monetizing your inner wealth. Well, what, you know, what does yeah, that simple. what does that mean? But before yeah. you go there, Hidden, we're gonna take yeah. a break, and before the break, I want to read to to a comment in on Facebook. Uh, sorry, on in, in, in the chat room, QTP said, uh, wasn't it that same enabling environment that the late LFS Barnum was trying to create by teaching us? to manufacture our own value-added products from what we produce. So like you said, it's a mindset. That, that foreign is better. So since the diagnosis is made and the idea of building our own country, where do you stand in all this regardless of political affiliation? Mm -hmm. um, you want me to answer that now? Yes, or yeah, yeah. Like... Give a, give a, 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 could you do it short or you want something? Yeah, yeah, I can give it a short answer. Okay, good. Um, what... LFS Burnham was proposing at the time was not a genuine transformational economic policy. What he was proposing was a survival tactic. At the time all of this was taking place in Guyana, remember Guyana had suffered from a significant decline in world commodity prices and sugar and rice and bauxite and so on. Guyana had no foreign exchange. Guyana had no ability to import anything because they had no foreign exchange. Mm -hmm. And nobody would lend Guyana money in order to import what they needed, spare parts and so on to keep the economy going. And so LFS Burner decided to adopt an approach of import substitution. So he, he banned a lot of um, imported items and so on in an effort to encourage people, to incentivize people to use their natural resources and create what they actually needed and so on. But there was no real enabling environment for that to be sustained. You can't just ask people to produce these items for their own good, but the, the economics of it was all wrong because you've got to create the environment in which people create these things and then they can export it to the rest of the world to make money from it so that they would keep doing it. It, it was always a case where people understood that they were doing this just out of pure survival. If that is the philosophy, how long do you think people are going to willingly continue to live that way? No, they're going to find any means necessary to get the stuff that they are custom eating, which is exactly what happened with the whole black market with food and so on. And the, and the, you remember in the 80s? Um, you had the, 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 the Hucksters, you remember yes, the Hucksters? Yes, I remember that too well, yeah. All right, well, I'm saying all of that came out of failed economic policies. End of story. Okay, let's take a break.
Hayden. Uh huh. Good. Good to see you again, my brother. Of course. <laughs> yes. Um. The, the 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 there was another before we we go into this whole thing about monetizing your inner wealth. Um. I want to visit the chat room again. Karen said you hit the nail on the head. They just want to be love it. I I I I believe that this applied to um, the discussion about. Um, not caring the color of someone's skin and their, you know, their um, ethnic background and so on. They just love their music. Hilly oh. asked, do you think there, can, there could come a time when the Caribbean youth will want to take on the political establishment? Hold that thought. Camille asked, what does Haiti need to get to do to get a hold on the fourth rung of the economic ladder? And Camille asked again, do you think that Trinidad and Tobago has the potential to be leaders in the green energy industry? Hidden. <laughs> let's 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 tackle the um, the first one. Hilly asks, do you think there could come a time when the Caribbean youth will want to take on the political establishment? Um, I think when the youth, the Caribbean youth, recognize that the state does in fact control so much of the resources that are necessary for them to advance in a positive way. When they finally come to the realization that being indifferent and attempting to ignore the dysfunctional political culture when they recognize that that isn't working because they cannot move forward unless they have access to the key resources, unless they can reallocate those resources in a way that they believe provides them with a better future. When they come to that realization, I think it is at that point they will have to make a hard decision in terms of taking control of the political culture and influencing in a more significant way um, decisions made by the state on their behalf. So I suspect, and this, this, this is something that I'm sure will be in the near future, the youth of the Caribbean will in fact become a lot more proactive, a lot more expressive of their political views. Um, but that's a process that will have to mature, if you will, over time, because the, the, the political culture tends to be stifling at times. And so for a young man in a household to speak out against the policies of a government, that maybe his parents um, overtly support. You know, his parents could be uh, members of the political party that's in government, his grandparents are members of that political party. Imagine a young man living in that household speaking out, as simple as it sounds, on Facebook, let's say, mm -hmm. speaking out against some of the policies of the government and so on with regard to education or even agriculture or even transportation. Um, imagine how ostracized he might feel in his open household. Right. But eventually, our young people will come to the realization that they are going to have to impact more significantly on political decisions. And that is at, it is at that point that they, be, they may become a lot more involved in active politics before i get in thank you for that answer Hayden. before i get into the other questions in the, in the um, chat room i want us to address the the the, the statement on on the ad about monetizing your wealth Let, let's let's address that force and then we can always come back and you know answer some of these questions Mm. What does well, you, you know, Selwyn is is simply you know monetizing monetizing your inner wealth. Um, I'm a firm believer of the fact that we're all blessed with K 
key talents mm -hmm. and that in many ways our talents are not explored sufficiently to allow us to translate those talents into real earnings. And there are a number of reasons for that. You know, people are sometimes channeled into particular fields of endeavor that are not consistent with their particular passions, their talents, how they feel about themselves and so on, how they see themselves. Nonetheless, the socializing forces around them, the church, the school, the family, um, peer groups and so on, all of those socializing forces may channel people in ways that is inconsistent with what the person's particular talent is, what the person's particular passion is. If we allow ourselves to be honest with ourselves, if we allow ourselves to embrace exactly what we do well and yes. who we really are as individuals, we may very well discover that there are things that we can do quite excellently from which we can make money. Yes. So, you know, somebody might be studying medicine, but they might be a great cook. Yes. But of course, it would be beneath them, given their, their current endeavor, it may be beneath them to refer to themselves as a chef. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but little do they know that their future may very well be in becoming a world-class chef, writing recipe books from now until they retire and making significant streams of income from, from royalties, from recipes, and so on, being celebrated by the best hoteliers around the world and that kind of thing. You know, we, we, we sometimes um, put on these blinkers because we have, the, we have been predetermined. Our fate in life has been predetermined as a result of which, instead of trying to get our careers to match who we are, we do it the other way around. We try to match ourselves mm -hmm. to some chosen career. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yes, 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 yes. So effectively, people have to be willing to identify what their true talents are. We all have talents. It's just a matter of identifying what they are and identify what their real passion is. And in so doing, they can marry their passion with their talent and create something that the world is willing to buy from you. It may be a product. It may be a service. It may just be your labor. Mm -hmm. But in laboring for someone else in a, in a job, per se, at least you will understand that your talent is actually getting teams to work well together. Mm -hmm. Well, explore that and become a trainer within organizations. You may not be an entrepreneur, you may be an intrapreneur. Mm -hmm. So within an organization, you may possess the wherewithal to be a change agent because of the talents that you possess. And you may be able to translate that into a service that you can sell not only to your organization, your current employer, but also to other organizations you know, on a consulting basis and so on. I am so simple. Mm -hmm. We have to identify our passions. We have to identify our true talents, marry the two, and find a way to sell that to the rest of the world and make a decent living from it. Wonderful formula. Wonderful formula for success. Um, for... for, for, for young people or the youth that that is listening right that are listening now and saying well okay that's that's great uh, i understand that and that makes a lot of sense um but i i am still faced with some of these socializing forces that that affect 
my path affect my choices and so on, careers and what I do. Um, how, and I, I, I believe in, 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 in bending a tree when it is young rather than waiting until it becomes, uh, it, gets, it gets older. How do you advise young people who are unsatisfied, dissatisfied, and reluctant to pursue what they are being um, channeled to, uh, but, and simply because their their parents are saying, "Look, I think it's beneath you to become a business person. Um, I want you to study medicine. I want you to study law, whatever the case might be." So there, there, there. I'm sure many many youth who are very conflicted right now and perhaps um, depressed. How do you advise them to deal with some of these socializing forces, especially when they are from their parents? Um, it is good to honor thy father and thy mother. And I think it is equally good for your father and your mother to provide you with the right environment in order to develop yourself as much as you can. Mm -hmm. It is important for young people to be able to have these conversations because this has to be done via a conversation. And even if, as a young person, you feel that you're on the losing end of that conversation. It is important that you hold on to your dream. And in much the same way, if you are going to the bank to convince a bank manager to lend you money, in much the same way, you may have to develop a communication strategy to discuss these issues with your parents and try to sell them on the ideas that you have. Make sure before you go to your parents, you are convinced that this is exactly what you want to do. And usually, it is a lot like when you're in love. Usually, you know, you just know. So in many ways, when you develop these ideas, if it is in fact in contravention of your current pathway and you believe that now is the right time for you to pursue these ideas, then one of the things that you may want to do is to develop a strategy to communicate this effectively to your parents and avoid the emotional outbursts, but have a very dispassionate discussion about the issue. Now, even if you're on the losing end of such a conversation, it is important that you honor your mother and your father. And you may have to, for a period of time, fulfill their desires on your behalf. Because, you know, after all, they fed you, they, they, they clothed you, they, 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 they housed you, they're paying your, your school fees, you know what I mean? Yes, I... I... I know that's you, you, you want to make sure that you honor your mother and your father. And you may have to live that double life where you are doing what they may want you to do while you postpone what you really want to do. I think sometimes that can work for those who have the stamina yes. to walk both pathways. For those who are impatient, I think sometimes you've got to insist on that conversation and keep having that conversation until a compromise can be achieved. It is a conversation. It is not an argument. It is not a debate per se. It is a conversation. And it is important that all parties hold a minimum level of respect during the course of that conversation. Sometimes it's good to get a mediator, you know, a godmother, a godfather, a grandmother, a grandfather, a trusted, a trusted confidant, a trusted family friend. You know, bring them in as a mediator. Let, let the parties agree. 
I, I, I can in the mediator, you know. I, I can see that mediator being an, a good alternative to the whip because there, there, there are those who might still, still be, um, be whipped for actually even broaching that topic. I mean, I, I know people when we were growing up that couldn't approach their parents, and uh, no matter how effective that conversation was, is that look, you're you're the child, I'm the parent, you know, you're gonna do what I say. And you're gonna do it how I do it. So I know, but remember, Selvin, we're talking about young people now. So I'm not. I anticipate that we're not talking about anybody who is a preteen. Right. No, so I'm. Right. We're talking about people who are in their late teens, early twenties. Well, that is true. And I and I think in in that respect, um, bringing in a mediator uh, is a, it, it can work in some instances. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, though, it's important for young people to know that while you honor your mother and your father, you must also ensure that you are able in this lifetime to pursue your passions. So even if the situation is a rough one, a tough one, a dire situation where your parents are not willing to listen, to contemplate, to consider anything other than what they have dreamed up for you, then look, you do what they've asked you to do. If you have the stamina, you pursue that course, you finish that course, you thank them for providing you with the opportunity, and then you now, being the adult, must now make the final decision. Well, because that course that they put you through should at least provide you with the opportunity to be financially independent of your parents by now. And it is at that point now, you're out of their house, you're out of their space, you're on your own. You must now find your way in this big bad world. It is at that point that you dig deep, remind yourself of your true passion, and you pursue it. Now, not everybody has that stamina. Not everybody has that patience. Not everybody will be able to defer and to deflect, you know, to genuflect in that kind of way to their parents. For those who can't do it, then I suggest that the best way forward is to get a mediator, somebody who can speak your language and who your parents also respect. Mm -hmm. And find a compromise. You may not get your own way at first, but at least if you can get your parents to budge ever so slightly where you can arrive at a workable compromise, then that's the best approach. I love that answer. Um, uh, Camille asked, do you think that Trinidad and Tobago has the potential to be leaders in the green energy industry? It's got to be quick. Time, time, is, time is on a, a, a yeah. If, yeah, Salo, repeat that. If Trinidad and Tobago has the potential to do what? To, to be leaders in the green energy industry. Oh, in the green energy industry. Um, actually, yes. Now, here's the problem. Uh, green energy, we're talking about sustainable energy. We're talking about um, energy sources we, uh, where we're looking at solar, we're looking at wind, we're looking at wave energy, um, we're looking at producing um, hydrocarbons from uh, agriculture and so on. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago, by virtue of its landmass, by virtue of the fact that it has the room to really do the research and promote these alternative sources of energy, Trinidad and Tobago can truly be a leader in that regard. There's no doubt about it. However, the willingness to pursue it, to invest in it, the returns are going to be minuscule in the early years. The payback period for such investments are going to be longer because our energy costs are heavily subsidized. Um, so the uptake, so, if, so for instance, if you wanted to get people to use solar water heaters in Trinidad and Tobago, um, and the solar water heater cost uh, upwards of 5,000 US to install, it's hardly likely that the typical householder will buy a solar water heater. Mm -hmm. What you've got to do at this stage is to make it very affordable. And, and to do so, one of the things that you may have to accomplish is to get the government to provide people with tax incentives to take up this new technology, to reduce their consumption of uh, um, 
the, the typical uh, hydrocarbon uh, produced uh, uh, electricity and so on, and utilize the alternative sources. So yeah, um, Trinidad and Tobago does have the, the wherewithal to be a leader in, 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 in that regard. And, and Karen asked, some total of no proper short and long term planning is failure. Suggestions to get that aspect going. She's talking about the long term planning. Yes, uh, says she said she asked. Uh, she said some t some total of no proper short and long term planning is failure. Suggestions to get that aspect going. Mm -hmm. Um, I think uh, when it comes to long term planning, I think it is it is important for us to clearly identify the end result. In other words, when we engage in long term planning, we should do one thing very clearly identify exactly what life should be like once we accomplish these objectives start with the end in mind and then work backwards um, until we get to the point where we can realistically do that both at an individual level both at a community level and a national level um, a lot of the planning that we do is going to be futile gotcha and, and the last last comment in the chat room qtp said i do not agree totally with your explanation and perspective on the bornham ideology but uh his this is for another um, form another forum and another time laugh out loud um hayden time is upon us and and i <laughs> i want to take this opportunity first of all to thank you so much for being such a gracious guest and, and so informative um I want to use this opportunity as well to invite you to come back at some point. I, I asked all my guests to return. Um, consider that CWS as, as, as another home. Uh, so, but also, I, I, I just want to encapsulate, encapsulate um, what, what I learned today, the importance of a vision, um, and the importance of identifying where you, where you want to be starting at the end, uh, where you are, and um, ha having uh, the, the strategy to bridge the gap between now and then and um, ha having good measurement. That's, in essence, what I, what, what, what I gathered. Now, yeah. could you close us off with some words of advice, some positive words of advice? To, uh, I have three words. I have three words. Passion, faith, and love. Ah, that is the foundation upon which any person, any human being can build a foundation for the future. Passion, faith, and love. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. This is um, Selwyn Collins of CWS saying good night. Thank you. Hayden. It's All right, Cello. Yes. It was great talking to you, and uh, we'll do this again sometime soon. Of course, my brother. Take care. Yeah, man, you too. Good night. Good night.